Good afternoon, this is Nikki going. We are now on session six of our discussion of the crucible, and today I'll be talking about the first half of Act Three in quite a lot of detail. I will deal with the second half of Act Three in our next session, which is session seven. As always, before you start reading and analyzing anything in depth, it's a very good idea to have a good overview of the major events. So have a clear understanding of the plot before you get going. Make sure you can answer that question, what happens? So I'll start by giving you an overview of the plot and I will begin by telling you the part of the plot that we're going to cover in this session. So you'll see that in this section of the play we see the power of the court. Remember that in Act 1 and in Act 2, we saw the power more of individuals and individual witchcraft accusations and also of individuals over other people. So Act 1 you can think of as Abigail's Act. She, her power is threatened. She uses witchcraft accusations to win back that power and to dominate Elizabeth. Act 2 you can think of as being Elizabeth's Act. This is the act where she speaks to John Proctor about their relationship. She makes him face the truth about Abigail and it is the beginning of her winning back his love and in that way defeating Abigail, even though she can't defeat Abigail in terms of her witchcraft accusations. Act 3 is much more public. Here we focus on the power of the court and the way that these witchcraft accusations have got completely out of hand. And we see this because before Mary Warren can even testify, she is thoroughly intimidated. And some serious questions are raised about just how just is this court? How likely is real justice to happen? Are they actually in pursuit of the truth? The events in Act 3 happen shortly after the arrest of Martha Corey, Rebecca Nurse and Elizabeth Proctor. Yet we see that Many, many people have been arrested in that very short time frame. So again, it emphasizes the enormous power of the court and how rapidly it has grown. The act starts with us overhearing Martha Corey being questioned. And it's significant that she's being questioned in what is, technically speaking, the proper court, the main body of the court, the Salem Meeting House. And the evidence that's presented against her is completely and utterly ludicrous, which I'll explain in a little more detail as we go on. If you understand the three major pieces of evidence presented in the first half of this play, it's, um, sorry, of this act, it's a very good route into understanding what's going on. So bear in mind that there are three sworn statements presented, and these are they. Firstly, Giles Corey testifies that Thomas Putnam is using witchcraft accusations in order to force the sale of land that he wants to buy. So basically, Thomas Putnam sees a piece of land that he likes, that he has his eye on. He gets his daughter, Betty Putnam, sorry, Ruth Putnam, Ruth Putnam, to accuse the owner of that land of witchcraft. The owner of that land is then charged with witchcraft. If the charge is successful and they're found guilty, um, their land is taken away from them and it becomes the property of the state. The state then auctions the land for very low prices and Putnam is about the only person in Salem who has the money to buy that land. So in this way, Putnam is able to very quickly, rapidly and vastly increase his land ownership. And of course, um, Giles Corey testifies that this is why Putnam is accusing others of witchcraft. And when he refuses to name his witness, Danforth then threatens to arrest him. So in each case, look at how the court responds to the particular evidence presented. Proctor then presents a sworn statement that Elizabeth Proctor, his wife, Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey have never practiced witchcraft and according to their neighbors who've known them for years, they've never seen any signs that they are witches and in fact that they have exemplary characters and have always behaved as God-fearing Puritan women. Danforth promptly orders the arrest of the 91 people who signed this statement. So again, you can see throughout this play that anyone who testifies something that disagrees with the court's version of events is going to find themselves to be held to be against the court and will probably be arrested and persecuted and prosecuted. 
The third bit of evidence presented is when Mary Warren is brought into the court by John Proctor to testify that she and the girls have invented all of the evidence of witchcraft that they have presented so far. Um, she says that it is pure pretense. And instead of immediately questioning Mary Warren, because this is a really serious allegation that undermines the court and everything that it has done so far, Danforth intimidates witnesses in front of her. He threatens her. He attempts to bribe Proctor with Elizabeth's safety and hints that Elizabeth's safety might be at risk if Proctor doesn't cooperate. And he issues the arrest of uh, arrest warrants for nearly 100 people in front of Mary Warren. And of course, by the time Mary Warren does testify, she is completely and utterly intimidated. So she starts sobbing and Proctor comforts her. Hale then says that the people that are terrified of the courts, the, sorry, Hale then says that people are terrified of the courts, and by doing so, he implies that they're scared that if they have anything to do with the courts, particularly if they oppose the courts, they will be falsely accused and they will be arrested. Danforth is angry and argues that anyone who is afraid of the court must be guilty. And increasingly, we can see that the logic applied to the witchcraft trials, or the lack of logic, is really faulty and Miller satirizes this and in so doing he's satirizing the kind of logic and evidence that was also being used in the McCarthy trials of the 1950s. As I said Mary Warren is terrified throughout the process and Proctor reassures her that because she's telling the truth she will be protected and of course that's one of the central ironies of the play because it is all the people who tell the truth who behave in a moral fashion, who refuse to lie, that land up being prosecuted, and many of them actually land up being hanged. They are not protected. Justice is not done. The truth is not served. So Hale begs Danforth uh, throughout this play, and this is where we get into the second half of Act 3, which I will de detail in Session 7, to allow Proctor to use a lawyer in order to present Mary Warren's testimony. And Danforth refuses. Now, you've got to ask yourself, what court interested in the truth, interested in justice, would, uh, would not only discourage but actually disallow a witness who is not trained in the law to use a lawyer? Mary Warren uh, then testifies and she um, finally gets to actually make her statement and in her testimony Abigail's power gets challenged but importantly Abigail is not defeated in this act. Abigail in fact gets her wish. Elizabeth remains accused of witchcraft by the end of the play and by the end of the act Mary Warren switches from testifying against Abigail and the girls to testifying against John Proctor. So she literally swaps sides. And the plot in this section, in session seven, is based on the evidence presented and then who is actually winning the case at any one point. And um, that's why it's important to understand the evidence that gets presented in this section. So the first bit of evidence that comes up in the second half of Act Three is the poppet. Proctor denies that Elizabeth ever kept poppets, and of course Danforth just changes the subject. Ab uh, Proctor presents the evidence that Abigail and the d girls danced naked in the forest. Paris denies it, and he knows he's lying. And of course this isn't evidence that suits Danforth's version of events, so he just changes the subject. Mary testifies that the girls pretended to be possessed by evil spirits, and she's told in answer to this, that she must now pretend to be possessed, in, but she can't do it in the court. And so the court concludes that Mary must be lying about the girl's pretense. Notice how they respond differently when they actually like the evidence that they're hearing. Danforth questions Abigail's honesty, and Abigail gets really angry and implies that Danforth could also be bewitched. So she actually threatens the highest judge in the court. Abigail then realizes that she's gone too far and she and the girls then pretend to be bewitched because when in doubt, when in trouble in Salem, pretend to be bewitched, blame someone else for your bewitchment 
and it's your get out of jail free card. And so Danforth stops questioning Abigail. Proctor realizes that Abigail and the girls are distracting the court by pretending to be bewitched. He even says, and now she'll suck a scream to stab me with. And he decides that at this point he has no other option but to admit to his adulterous affair with Abigail. And he's hoping by admitting this that Abigail will then be seen as an unreliable witness. Because if she's prepared to commit adultery, which is a serious sin in Salem, how can she be be believed about anything else? Danforth counters by calling Elizabeth into the court to testify. Elizabeth then denies Proctor's affair with Abigail, and it's natural. She wants to protect Proctor's reputation. And of course, the court is really pleased with this, and they conclude that Abigail is honest and Proctor must be lying. Hale argues, because Hale increasingly sees that the court isn't pursuing the aims of justice, um, and he argues that Elizabeth's lie must have been to protect Pro Proctor. It's a natural lie to tell and that Abigail is a liar. Abigail and the girls counter by pretending to be bewitched. They pretend that Mary Warren is bewitching them. And of course, the court ignores Hale and believes the girls. The court then charges Mary Warren with witchcraft. And Mary Warren swaps sides. She defends herself in the only way she can. She accuses others of witchcraft. She says that Proctor bewitched her. And the court then charges Proctor with witchcraft. So as we proceed through this act, some questions you want to ask yourself is, are, is the court actually seeking truth and justice? And if they're not seeking truth and justice, what do they really want to prove? And why do they want to prove it? How does this court react to evidence that it doesn't want to hear as opposed to evidence that it does want to hear? Who has power in the scene? Why do they have power in the scene? And how is their power linked to the court? And if you read the play as a battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good, who's winning at each point in the act as the act develops? And then finally, and perhaps most significantly and ironically, which side do you think the Puritan church is on? And by extension, the Puritan court. Is it actually on the side of good and heaven? Or is it on the side of evil and therefore of the devil? Things to notice. Some witnesses are subjected to far more harsh questioning than others. Think about which witnesses those are. Paris, Danforth and Hathorne deal with the testimony that they don't want to hear in very different ways. Danforth and Hathorne tend to be much more calculating in their approach. Paris tends to panic and get hysterical. Hale, Nurse, Corey and Proctor's attitude to, towards the court shifts as this so-called trial proceeds and as this, the act develops. They start off by believing that the court is somewhere where they can attain justice. By the end of this act, they are thoroughly disillusioned. Abigail isn't even in the court for the first half of the act, but her power and the witchcraft accusations that she's made permeate the entire act, and her presence is still very much felt. She's still incredibly powerful throughout. So important themes that will be discussed. Obviously, the evidence of witchcraft gets satirized. Miller's going to present it as completely ridiculous, and that's linked to the USA and the McCarthy trials that were happening in Miller's America of 1950, where the evidence, as McCarthy saw it, was also completely ridiculous and often twisted by the courts. This is linked to that tension between reputation, how people see you, as opposed to integrity, real, genuine honesty and moral values, and how increasingly it's impossible to have integrity and a good reputation. And of course, that is linked to attention in the court because it's increasingly impossible to have justice and the um, regard of the court. Uh, this is linked to motives for witchcraft accusations. So think about why people accuse others of witchcraft in the scene. Self-defense, greed, land, these things all come up. This is linked to the dualistic worldview because obviously it was this tendency to see the world in absolute terms, good versus bad, heaven versus hell, um, 
the court and Salem versus the forces of evil and people like the Proctors that made these people incredibly vulnerable to the witchcraft trials and witchcraft accusations. And that, of course, is linked to who has power in Salem and who doesn't. And notice how power is manipulated throughout and who does the manipulating and how they use the court to do that. And that, of course, is linked to these layers of reality and truth and the tension between what appears to be true and what is actually true that we see throughout the play. So some important imagery that's going to be addressed. Biblical imagery is used throughout this act to highlight that idea of a supernatural battle between the forces of good and evil and how the people of Salem saw everything in such absolute terms. The four stories or um, narratives that are used are the idea of heaven speaking through the court's witnesses, which are the children, the story of the murder of Abel by his brother Cain, the separation of light and darkness, which happens in Genesis in the Bible, and the story of the archangel Raphael and the boy Tobias, where the archangel tell, told Tobias, do that which is right and you will be protected. And of course, What's really important and symbolically significant in this is the setting. So for the first time in Act 3, we have a semi-public setting. This isn't the bedroom upstairs in the Paris household as in Act 1. It isn't um, Elizabeth Proctor's uh, common room as in Act 2. It's not a private space. But it isn't, and very importantly, the main courtroom which is now being held in the Salem Meeting House. And if you think about the significance of that, the court and the Meeting House are literally and metaphorically inseparable. We are now holding a court case in the same place as the church services because the court, the church, the government are the same thing. But everything that happens in Act 3 actually happens in the vestry room, which is a little room off to the side of the court. Um, and it's now used as an anteroom to the court. And think about why Miller does that. So a vestry room is literally a dressing room and a storeroom. It's a place where the minister and the elders would get dressed before the service, and it was used to store things like prayer books and Bibles. It isn't the main meeting room. And an anteroom is an entry hall or waiting room. So the main meeting room is being used as the official court. But Danforth and Hathorne conduct all of their interrogations um, in this act, in the vestry room, the anteroom, the waiting room, instead of the main court. And I think what Miller is doing is he's highlighting the fact that what happens in the vestry room isn't actually legitimate, legal, morally correct, um, or even justice. It's off to one side. And it's also part of Danforth and Hathorne's um, plan to hide this evidence that they hear. So at the beginning of the act, we overhear the, um, a so-called real trial. And note that, the, that what happens after that in the vestry room, the anteroom, isn't actually a real trial and therefore doesn't happen in the meeting house or the real courtroom. So some important vocabulary, just make sure you understand this. A warrant is a legal document that allows a policeman or officer working for a court to arrest a person. An affidavit is a written statement where a witness is prepared to swear an oath that what they put in that statement is actually true. And an oath is, of course, a promise taken in a court that is binding. A deposition is evidence given by a witness who swears that the oath or promise that they've sworn um, is true. And a charge is a legal accusation. A testimony is much like a deposition or an affidavit. It is a formal written or spoken a statement made in court. And you must remember that anyone who lies in an affidavit, a deposition or a testimony is guilty of perjury, which is, is actually a crime and punishable with a jail sentence. So the the Act opens when Giles Corey bursts into the main court where his wife is on trial and he shouts that he has evidence for the court. Ironically, he's immediately bundled out of the court 
um, because they don't want to listen to his evidence. So you've got to ask yourself, what kind of court doesn't want to listen to evidence? And Herrick literally carries Giles out of the court into the vestry room. Hale and Hathorne come into that vestry room and they try to calm Giles down. And um, Giles establishes his good reputation. So he says um, uh, that he's old enough to answer questions. And he says that he has 600 acres. He has timber in addition. And he points out that it is his wife that is being condemned in the court. And of course, we're going to go on and hear just how ridiculous the evidence used to condemn Giles Corey's wife, Martha Corey, actually is. Um, we start meeting the judges of the court. And um, the scene opens when we overhear Hathorne and Danforth questioning Martha Corey. And as I said, their evidence is presented as completely ridiculous. And you can see that Miller is satirizing the court and its processes. So Martha Corey says, I am innocent to a witch. I know not what a witch is. And then Hathorne, who is a qualified judge, says, how do you know then that you are not a witch? And this opens the ridiculous possibility that people can commit crimes and be found guilty of those crimes without even knowing that they committed the crimes. And this means that anyone could actually be accused of witchcraft because the court can turn around and say, well, how do you know that you're not a witch? If, um, or how do you know then that you're not a witch? when we have evidence that you actually committed witchcraft. So bear that in mind that the real court is satirized in the opening lines of the act. And then we go into the unofficial, even less legitimate court held in the ante room and the vestry room. And Giles Corey tries to testify and he weeps because the evidence that is used against Martha, his wife, he provided accidentally, and he says, It's my third wife, sir. I never had no wife that be so taken with books, and I thought to find the cause of it, do you see? But it were no witch I blamed her for. I have broke charity with the woman. I have broke charity with her. And again, the court is satirized because Martha Corey was arrested because Giles Corey very innocently asked why he couldn't say his prayers when she was reading her books. And, of course, Miller told us it was because he had only just married her. He had only just become religious. He didn't know his prayers, and he needed his wife to help him say them. And that evidence given by a loving husband against his wife, uh, well, it wasn't even evidence, it was just a question, is twisted and used as evidence against Martha Corey that she must somehow be a witch and committing witchcraft. Francis Nurse is another prominent member of the Salem community who also tries to testify. Like Giles Corey, he has a very good reputation. He is a major landowner. You would have noticed that Giles Corey told the court he has 600 acres and a timber in addition. And he points out that it is his wife that is being condemned. Um, and Danforth also establishes that Francis Nurse has a good reputation. He says that... Francis Nurse could possibly be in such uproar. And of course, Danforth seems to be ignoring the fact that these men's wives are being accused of witchcraft. They might even be hanged. So again, the evidence of witchcraft and the way that justice seems to work in these courts is being satirized. And um, there is an undermining of people's integrity at the expense of them having a good reputation. As I said, uh, we discover that Giles Corey and Francis Nurse have been desperately trying to present evidence for a whole three days to the court. And this is the first time that anyone is coming close to actually listening to them. Probably only because Giles Corey caused such an uproar when he went charging into Martha Corey's trial. Francis says that he has proof that will undermine the whole trial process. He says, Excellency, we have proof for your eyes. God forbid you shut them to it. The girls, the girls, sir, are frauds. We have proof of it, sir. They are all deceiving you. And you can imagine for Danforth, he's already tried and condemned lots of people to death. He's got the jails are packed to bursting. And now he hears that his star witnesses, the girls, uh, upon all, whom all these charges rest, have been pretending that they are frauds and that Francis Nurse can prove it. And you can just imagine the cold 
thrill of shock and horror that runs through Danforth and Hathorne when they hear this. So Danforth is shocked, but notice studying Francis. So Danforth never reacts immediately. He's very calculating in how he's going to respond. So what they proceed to do, these judges, Danforth and Hathorne, is they intimidate the witnesses and they often use the law to counterattack. And again, this is satirizing the so-called legal process that's happening here and the way that the trials in the USA actually worked as well. So Danforth, first of all, describes Corey and Nurse's approach to the court as disruption and uproar, but he ignores the fact that nobody was actually listening to them and their evidence was not being admitted. Hathorne says, how dare you come roaring into this court? Are you gone daft, Corey, implying that Corey is actually mad? Um, Danforth then says, do you take it upon yourself to determine what this court shall believe and what it shall set aside? Whereas you would think the normal operation of a court would be to try and consider all relevant evidence and then decide what it is going to believe or set aside. But before he's even heard the evidence, he's objecting to it. And Danforth says, then let him submit his evidence in proper affidavit. You are certainly aware of our procedure here, Mr. Hale. And to Herrick, he says, clear this room. And of course, that's ironic because um, Francis Nurse and Giles Corey want to produce evidence for their wives' defense. And Danforth says, well, that has to be produced in a suitable legal format, which is a sworn statement or an affidavit. And then he tells Herrick he must clear the room. Why doesn't he want other people to hear the evidence that um, Corey and, and Nurse are going to present? Certainly if it, justice is what he is intending. Um, Hathorne uh, says that both Francis Nurse and Giles Corey must be arrested and held in contempt, sir. So this is what happens to people that are uh, behaving in a way that is unsuitable for a court. And of course, that would be logical if the court was actually willing to pursue the ends of justice. And uh, Danforth tells Francis Nurse, let you write your plea and in due time I will. And of course, then he's interrupted. But again, he is using the law to try and block the actual process of justice, which is a very ironic uh, way of approaching the law. Um, Danforth asks Corey and Nurse, do you know that near, near to 400 are in the jails from Marblehead to Lynn and upon my signature? And the subtext there is, do you know how powerful I am? How many people I have already condemned? And 72 condemned to hang by that signature? Now this is probably just a few days after Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey and Elizabeth Proctor were arrested. And already we have gone up to 400 people arrested and 72 condemned. So you can see how fast these witchcraft trials have grown and how powerful Abigail's allegations have become. Um, in the previous scene, sorry, uh, we knew that only 39 women were in court and now we're up to 400. And of course, it's at this point that Hale actually steps in. And ironically, he's a reverend. He's not a lawyer, but he's the person that is trying to actually fight for justice. He was originally brought in to identify witches. And here he's arguing that, in fact, many of these so-called witches are perhaps not witches and that certainly the evidence must be very carefully reviewed. Um, and he tries to get the court to be compassionate and to pursue justice. So he says, Excellency, he, that's Francis Nurse, claims hard evidence for his wife's defense. I think that in all justice you must, and that's when Danforth says, then let him submit his evidence in proper affidavit. You are certainly aware of our procedure here, Mr. Hale. So Danforth resorts to the law whilst Hale is arguing for justice. And it's a bit like that separation that we see increasingly between reputation, what looks good, and integrity, what is actually true and moral. Um, here we've got uh, the pursuit of legalities, what looks like proper legal processes, versus the pursuit of actual justice. 
Um, Mary Warren arrives with Proctor, who tries to give Danforth a signed deposition, saying that the girls never saw any spirits and that the evidence used so far in the witchcraft trials was actually a lie. And you'll notice that the court resorts to their standard um, response. They uh, use distraction. They use intimidation. They go after the witnesses and they start questioning their integrity before they actually allow them to testify. So Danforth starts by intimidating Mary and questioning Proctor about his motives. And Paris also continues with his bullying and intimidation. And we see this when Proctor tries to present Mary's signed deposition. Danforth says he accepts no depositions. This is minutes after he said to Giles Corey, Giles Corey that he had to present his evidence in a signed affidavit and he asked Hale if he wasn't aware of their procedure and their process there. So why is it that he insists on one set of rules for Giles Corey but doesn't want to actually accept written evidence when he's presented with it by Danforth? Um, again, he tries to, very hard to intimidate Mary Warren before she can testify and you can see the intimidation building up as the scene proceeds. So he starts off by questioning Mary Warren, saying that he had heard that she hadn't come to court for over a week because she was sick. So, of course, he's implying, were you lying then? Why weren't you in court? What were you trying to escape from or avoid? Um, Mary Warren then starts her testimony and almost immediately Danforth changes the subject. He threatens her and he questions Proctor. So Danforth thinks Again, there's that telling word in Miller's stage direction. He thinks Danforth is extremely calculating, staring at Proctor, then turns to Mary Warren. And you, Mary Warren, how came you to cry out people for sending their spirits out against you? So how was it that you started accusing people of witchcraft? And Mary says, it were pretense, sir. We were just pretending. Danforth says, I cannot hear you. Ironic, because he really cannot afford to hear this evidence because it undermines the court, it undermines him, it undermines the theocracy in Salem. And this is something that increasingly we see he cannot allow. And um, Proctor steps in and he says, it were pretense, she says. So he goes with the literal meaning of you co literally can't hear her. And Danforth, very sarcastic. Ah, and the other girls, Susanna Walcott and the others, they are also pretending. So he's basically saying, are you accusing the others as well as implicating yourself? Mary Warren, I, sir. And when Proctor first came in with Mary Warren, um, this was Danforth and Paris's reaction. So Paris, on seeing her in shock, Mary Warren, he goes directly to being close to her face. What are you about here? So he starts off, this is Paris, as an officer of the court, although he's a reverend, he's on the side of the court. He starts off with physical intimidation, gets very close to Mary Warren, basically gets in her face in modern terms and asks her what she's playing at. What is she up to? And Danforth, um, when he asks um, who is this of Proctor, Paris immediately resorts to his typical character assassination and intimidation. Beware this man, Your Excellency. This man is mischief. They've come to overthrow the court, sir. This man is... Now, if you know anything about logic, what Paris is doing here is called poisoning the well. It's when you undermine someone's evidence by undermining their character before they've even had a chance to speak. So you can see how from the very beginning, Paris and Danforth are not playing by the rules of a court or by justice, and they're after proving one particular point of view. Um, and in response to Mary Warren's testimony, Paris again resorts to character assassination and intimidation. He says in a sweat because he's terrified, Excellency, you surely cannot let so vile a lie be spread in open court. Now, the normal response to evidence is, can you prove that? Not an automatic assumption that it's a lie. And, and Danforth then starts interrogating Proctor and Mary Warren, and he emphasizes throughout they're challenging the authority of the court. Basically, do you know what you're doing? Do you know the risk you're taking? Do you know what you are up against? I pray you, 
Mr. Parris, do you know, Mr. Proctor, that the entire contention of the state in these trials is that the voice of heaven is speaking through the children? And you, Mary Warren, how came you to cry out people for sending their spirits out against you? So the problem with these trials is, is, is right here in this quote. Danforth is basically saying that the state of Salem is both the prosecution and the judge. And you can't be on one side and a neutral or unbiased judge. And he says that the state is arguing that it, the voice of heaven is speaking through the children. So again, you can see this dualistic worldview and how it's satirized. Because if the voice of heaven is speaking through the children, that means that the children are on the, on the side of heaven. Because they're on the side of the court and Danforth and Hathorne, that means that Danforth and Hathorne are on the side of heaven. And anyone who questions or undermines the court by definition, has to be on the side of hell and evil. So the chances of them actually being believed when they bring counter evidence is basically slim to non-existent. Um, and we see here that these children are the star witnesses of the court and that it's really not in the court's interest, if, it's, if you see the court is personified by Danforth and Hathorne, to... Um, undermine their own witnesses they see them as their own witnesses and they're going to put all their energy into proving that um, Mary Warren and the girls are not in fact pretending and haven't been lying because otherwise they're undermining themselves so there's some important imagery here again it's the imagery you see throughout of a supernatural battle between the forces of good and evil so when Danforth says that the voice of heaven is speaking through these children he is implying that heaven, the court, and the court's witnesses are on the side of good, and anyone in opposition must be on the side of evil or hell. And this is the kind of picture that he's planting in people's heads, that these are innocent children and that God and the angels are speaking through them. Um, and Danforth also uses the law to counterattack, okay? And he threatens Proctor and Mary Warren if their testimony is found to be untrue. Notice that when uh, the, the witnesses that are supposedly on the side of the court um, are asked if they are lying, they're not subjected to nearly as much threat and intimidation. So Danforth says, it strike hard upon me that she will dare come here with such a tale. So dare, it implies a huge threat. Now, Mr. Proctor, before I decide whether I shall, shall hear you or not, it is my duty to tell you this. We burn a hot fire here. It melts down all concealment. So he's basically saying to Mary Warren that she could suffer the equivalent pain of being burned to death if she's lying and that they will somehow get the lies out of her and that the process won't be a lot of fun. And, of course, this imagery is really important because it links to the title of the play, which is The Crucible. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner of this picture, there is a picture of a crucible. So a crucible is essentially a fireproof container in which metal is melted. And um, in the process, when you melt down the metal or the ore that contains the metal, you separate off the impurities. So Salem and the witchcraft trials can be seen as a crucible that exposes impurities, exposes sin, exposes wrongdoing. Of course, the, the irony here is that the wrongdoing that is exposed is not of the people that Danforth and Hathorne and the courts say are evil and lying. The evil that's exposed is the evil of the court itself. Okay, And here, fire is used as a purifying, uh, purifying force, like the courts. So this isn't the fire of hell. This is more the fire of purgatory, where people suffer for their sins and come out, if they do come out, the other side better and purer. And as I said, it's linked to that imagery of the crucible, which is how the court and perhaps on a larger scale, Salem itself is described. And as I said, crucibles melt metals and remove impurities. So the court is meant to remove impurities from Salem society. But ironically, the impurities it exposes are the impurities of the hypocrites that are running the court. And it's linked to the title of the play. 
So Danforth goes on to imply that Proctor is lying. Before he's even heard his evidence, he suggests that maybe Proctor's going to lie because he wants to defend his wife, Elizabeth. I understand well a husband's tenderness may drive him to extravagance in, defend of, in defense of a wife. Are you certain in your conscience, mister, that your evidence is the truth? Undermines that before he's even heard it. And, of course, Danforth then goes on to imply that if a person wants to undermine the court, they might be possessed by an evil spirit. It's probably quite likely that they are on the side of the devil and evil because they are opposing the voices of angels that are speaking through the children. And, of course, to the average person in Salem, this is what they've got in their head, this personified devil that stalks the world for the ruin of souls. And he actually asks... Um, whether Proctor is working for that devil. So um, Danforth hears Cheever's evidence that Proctor ripped the warrant for Elizabeth's arrest. And of course that evidence can be interpreted that Proctor is against the court. And because he's against the court, he must be against God and the church and um, everyone that works for God. And Proctor explains, no, he just lost, he lost his temper when his wife was arrested and that's why he ripped the warrant. But Danforth says to him, there lurks nowhere in your heart nor hidden in your spirit any desire to undermine this court. And of course, any evidence against the court is, present, is interpreted as undermining. And therefore, in the long run, working for the devil. He actually asks Proctor, have you ever seen the devil? Have you worked for the devil? He asks Proctor whether or not he's a good Christian and a Puritan, which is subtext for are you on the side of the court? And then he goes on to say, well, if you are a good Christian, why haven't you been to church every Sunday? And of course, Proctor explains it's because he has had to plow on Sundays. His wife is ill. His farm is not doing very well. And um, Hale steps in again to fight for justice. He reminds Danforth that the court should be seeking truth, not attacking witnesses who bring unwelcome evidence to them. Giles points out, you'll find other Christians that do plow on a Sunday if the truth be known. And Hale says, you, your honor, I cannot think you may judge a man on such evidence. So this is really um, minor evidence on which to convict someone for witchcraft or not. Ironically, Hale asked these very same questions in Act 2, but you can see here how he shifted because now he thinks that this isn't actually particularly relevant or good evidence of witchcraft or evil. Um, Danforth even tells Proctor how prejudiced he is. And remember, prejudice means prejudice, judging before you have the facts. He tells Proctor he's unlikely to believe Mary Warren, and she hasn't even testified yet. You can imagine poor old Mary sitting there thinking, what kind of trouble am I going to get into? Ironically, he starts off with this by saying that he, as a judge, judges nothing. And that he's not biased. And then he proceeds to make a statement that proves that he very much is. And even Proctor gets intimidated. So Danforth says, I judge nothing. Look at the stage directions. There's a pause. And he watches Proctor, who tries to meet his gaze. So he's just staring at him, really intimidating. I tell you straight, mister, I have seen marvels in this court. I have seen people choked before my eyes by spirits. I have seen them struck by pins and slashed by daggers. I have until this morning not the slightest reason to suspect that the children may be deceiving me. Do you understand my meaning? So the subtext there is, I'm utterly convinced that witchcraft has happened. It's happened in front of me. I really don't think that you can possibly have any evidence that it hasn't. Are you sure you want to go ahead with these uh, allegations? Because you could land up in a lot of trouble. That's his subtext. Do you understand my meaning? Um, he goes on to imply that Proctor isn't a good Puritan, that even that he's evil. And he uses the story of the murder of Abel by Cain as evidence that people can look good, seem good, behave well, right up until the very moment when they suddenly become evil. And of course that ties into that idea that people can be possessed by evil. He implies that Proctor would believe this and he wouldn't be arguing with this if he was a good Puritan. So basically he would believe what the court is arguing. 
that these women were possibly good right up until the time that they suddenly and spontaneously decided they were going to work for the devil. So Proctor responds very cleverly. He says that the story of the Bible, the story in the Bible that people can suddenly become evil obviously applies to Cain and Abel, but it's not necessarily true of Rebecca Nurse and the dead babies, that you can't say that because this happened with Cain and Abel that Rebecca Nurse suddenly took it upon herself to murder dead babies. And of course, this is an argument that Danforth can't really counter, so he changes the subject. Um, and he tries to bribe Proctor, which I'll explain in a minute. So just um, again, you've got biblical imagery, the story of Cain and Abel. Again, it's used to describe a supernatural battle between the forces of good and evil. Because Cain can be considered to be God's man on earth. Uh, God was pleased with him. God was pleased with his behavior, with his sacrifices, with his religious approach. And Abel was so jealous of God's approval that Abel killed Cain. And Cain therefore comes to symbolize evil and the first person in humanity to commit murder. And of course, the subtle parallel that um, Danforth is drawing here is that perhaps Rebecca Nurse was jealous of Goody Putnam, who's a pillar of the church. And because she was jealous, because Goody Putnam was approved by God, Rebecca Nurse sided with the devil and murdered Goody Putnam's babies using witchcraft. And um, that's where the envy comes in, and that's where the parallel is. Um, so then, Dan, when, when that argument doesn't work, Danforth tries a different approach. He basically tries to, to bribe Proctor, although it's not obvious enough so that you can say that it, it is an outright bribe. But he says that Elizabeth Proctor claims that she is pregnant. Now think, why is he only telling Proctor this now, that his imprisoned wife says that she's pregnant? And Danforth offers to wait until Elizabeth actually starts showing signs of pregnancy. And then he will let her live another year before she will be charged. And where the sort of bribery element comes into it, he says that a year is long. So here he's implying that in the course of a year, Elizabeth might not ever be convicted. And the subtext is, of course, if you cooperate with us, your wife would be safe. Um, he basically says if Proctor drops his charges, Elizabeth will be spared. And Proctor refuses to drop the charges. Um, he's going to continue to say that Abigail and the girls have been lying and pretending all the time. And he explains that he can't drop the charges because Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse are still accused and Mary Warren's evidence could free them. So ironically, the man that is being accused of, of witchcraft and undermining the court and evil and all sorts of things by an officer of the court is the man that insists on actually pursuing justice to its logical conclusion. He still wants to free Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse, even if his wife is going to be freed. So out of loyalty to Giles and Francis and the truth, he feels that Mary must testify. And then Danforth realizes this testimony is inevitable and he's got to do a bit of damage control. So he decides he's going to hear Mary Warren's testimony, but before he does, um, he takes measures to ensure that the people of Salem don't actually hear about it. Because he realizes that Mary Warren's testimony, certainly if it goes public, will undermine all of the charges that the Puritan court has has. Uh, prosecuted so far. It will undermine the children's testimony and in the process, because the church and the court are inseparable, it will undermine the Puritan church and all the sentences that Danforth and the court have already passed. And in the Act 4, Danforth actually makes a link between the church and God. He says he will not crack God's voice. But I think a big part of this is Danforth doesn't want to undermine himself. He doesn't want to be seen to have made a series of of really disastrous mistakes and to have got it wrong. So he makes sure that Mary's testimony is kept secret. So the first thing he asks Proctor, he's checking how many people know about this. He says, and you thought to declare this revelation in the open court before the public. And of course, Proctor's reaction is, well, why not? You know, if it's true and it's in the interests of justice, surely that's the right place to declare it. Okay, 
Um, and instead of saying, right, let's move into the court where evidence should be heard, Danforth says, Marshall, go into the court and bid Judge Stoughton and Judge Sewell to declare recess for one hour and let them go to the tavern if they will. So he sends these other judges out to lunch. And he says, all witnesses and prisoners are to be kept in the building. So this way, the news can't travel. Um, and when he finally agrees to hear Mary Warren, he also does a bit of PR, a bit of spin. He creates the impression that he is interested in truth and justice, even though all of his actions so far suggest that really that's not what he's after. So he starts off with, now what deposition do you have for us, Mr. Proctor? And I beg you, be clear, open as the sky and honest. And of course, the sky is usually used as an image for heaven. So be on the side of, of heaven and truth and justice. Tell us the truth, Mr. Proctor. And of course, um, this is where we start to see some of the motives for witchcraft accusations, as well as that tension between reputation and integrity. Because Proctor hands over a testament to the good character of Elizabeth Proctor, Rebecca Nurse, and, Ma and Martha Corey. And we discover that 91 of their neighbors, who have known them for most of their lives, have signed this testament that says that they've never seen any evidence that these women have committed witchcraft, that these women have got really good characters, they've never done anything but good. And Danforth's immediate response is, arrest the 91 people who signed the testament. And if you think about that, surely that satirizes this idea that the courts are actually after um, truth and justice. And it also shows how having um, integrity is not good enough. That, and if your reputation is undermined, you lose power. Francis Nurse is horrified. He persuaded these people to sign, and now he feels like he's betrayed them. And Nurse, of course, symbolizes people who believe that the courts were actually interested in justice. They are the people that have been um, basically deceived by this illusion of justice. And again, Hale steps in. He tries to fight for justice. He reminds Danforth that the court should be seeking truth and not undermining witnesses. And um, when Paris says, this is a clear attack upon the court, Hale responds, you know, really angry. He's trying to contain himself. Is every defense an attack upon the court? Can no one? So basically, can't you question the evidence presented in the court without being accused of witchcraft and being evil? Um Notice that any criticism of the court is taken as a criticism of God or heaven and a personal criticism of Danforth. Paris says, all innocent and Christian people are happy for the courts in Salem. These people are gloomy for it. And he says to Danforth, and I think you will want to know from each and every one of them, what discontents them with you? So now any questioning of evidence becomes a personal attack on Danforth and a direct attack on the court. And of course, it's that dualistic good versus evil worldview that is so problematic and that Miller is satirizing. Danforth uh, responds with the very illogical, then I am sure they may have nothing to fear, as he hands over the arrest warrant to Cheever. Mr. Cheever, have warrants drawn for all of these, arrest for examination. Now these people know 400 people have already been arrested. They're going to be dragged into the prisons for questioning. I'm sure they're not going to feel very confident. And then he turns to um, Procter and he says, now, mister, what other information do you have for us? And the subtext is, who else are you going to hand over for arrest? And Francis is still standing. He's horrified. And he says, you may sit, Mr. Nurse. And Francis, I have brought trouble on these people I have. And of course, Danforth says, no, old man, you've not hurt these people if they're of good conscience. And here you can see that dualistic worldview. But you must understand, sir, that a person is either with this court or must be counted against it. There is no road between. This is a sharp time now, a precise time. We live no longer in the dusky afternoon where evil mixed itself with good and befuddled the world. Now, by God's grace, the shining sun is up and them that fear not light will surely praise it. I hope you are not, you will not be one of those. So basically, if you are unhappy with the court, you are working against God, you are working for the devil, and um, 
you are on the side of evil. And he says that these good and evil can be absolutely separated. So he's referring to the biblical story where God separated light from darkness in the book of Genesis. And of course, the outcome of that was that God created order from chaos. He's basically saying that the court is doing what God did. They've created order from chaos. They know the difference between light and shadows, good and evil, heaven and hell, bad people and good. He says the time of not knowing who is good or evil, which is represented by the dusky afternoon, is now over. And of course, the irony of the play is that you can see increasingly that good and evil are actually mixed up and very hard to tell apart for just about everybody except the audience. We notice how Danforth has still delayed listening to Mary Warren's testimony. She's watched him bully witnesses. She's increasingly intimidated. She starts weeping. Proctor tries to comfort her with the idea that people who do the right thing are rewarded and protected by God. By the end of Act 4, you're going to see that those are the very people that are actually hanged as witches. Danforth, as Mary Warren suddenly sobs, kind of says, Ah, she's not hearty, I see. And of course, he's being sarcastic here. Like, what's wrong with her? And Proctor says, no, she's not, sir. And he bends down to Mary and holds her hand and says, now remember what the angel Raphael said to the boy Tobias. Remember it. And again, it's that biblical imagery. Again, there's the tension between the forces of good and evil. Tobias and his mother Sarah in the Old Testament of the Bible prayed to God for help. So the implication is if you're good and you pray to God for help, he'll help you. God sends the archangel Raphael disguised as a human to help them. And Raphael tells Tobias that if he does what is morally right, he will always be safe. And of course, at this point, many of the witnesses against the church believe that ultimately, if they tell the truth, they'll be safe. The truth will out, justice will prevail. And they're going to be proved horribly wrong. So Danforth then establishes that Corey is a bit of a fool. He asks him about his previous law cases. He finds out that Corey has no lawyers. He finds out that Corey has very few legal skills. And then he allows Corey to hand over his written testimony. And, Dan and Danforth calls on Putnam to defend himself. Notice that he doesn't question Putnam. He never actually asks Putnam um, any kind of hard questions. Could this possibly be true? So he just says, Mr. Putnam, I have here an accusation by Mr. Corey against you. He states that you cold coldly prompted your daughter to cry witchery upon George Jacobs, who is now in jail. So what um, Corey is saying is that Putnam knew that J George Jacobs had a really valuable piece of land. He got his daughter, um, Ruth Putnam, to accuse George Jacobs of witchcraft. George Jacobs gets arrested. If he's found guilty of witchcraft, his land will go to the state. And then Putnam will bid for the land, which will be sold for just about nothing. And because Putnam has got loads of money, he is about the only person who is able to take advantage of this. So he's basically using witchcraft as a way to gain land, which is why um, the witchcraft accusations, that's one of the motives for those accusations. It's straight out greed. And when Putnam says that Corey's testimony is a lie, Danforth doesn't even question Putnam any further. Instead, he questions Corey. He says, where's your evidence? And he says, um, tell me who your witness is. And um, when Corey refuses to name his witness, because anyone who testifies against the court, as we've seen, gets arrested and threatened, Danforth then threatens to arrest Corey. And again, Hale tries to get the court to seek truth and justice. So Hale says um, to uh, says to Danforth that he reminds him of his duty, and Danforth subtly implies that Hale might actually be against the court and on the side of evil. So Hale says, "We cannot blink it more. There's prodigious fear of this court in the country." And Danforth says, "Then there's prodigious guilt in the country. Are you afraid to be questioned here?" So immediately he makes that link between fear of the court and guilt. Again, if you're not with this court, you're against it. And um, Hale, as you can see, is losing faith in the courts. He's losing faith in the theocracy of Salem. He no longer sees the courts and God as inseparable. 
And he says, I may only fear the Lord, sir, but there's fear in the country nevertheless. And Danforth is really angry. He says, reproach me not with fear in the country. There is fear in the country because there is a moving plot to topple Christ in the country. Again, if you're not with the court, you're against the court and you're against God. And Hale says, but it does not follow that everyone accused is part of it. He undermines the logic of the court. And Danforth, no uncorrupted man may fear this court, Mr. Hale. None. And of course, Danforth then places Giles under arrest for contempt of court. Giles tries to physically attack Putnam. Giles warns Proctor any evidence he gives to the court will only be twisted and used to hang them. And again, that's Elizabeth's imagery from Act 2, the noose, the noose is up. And Proctor again reassures Giles that once Mary has testified, the court will be proved wrong. So what you want to think about at this at the end of this act is how power has now shifted. At the top, we've got Danforth and Hathorne, the officers of the court, on the side of God, supposedly. Then we have Paris, the Putnams, Abigail and the girls. Beneath them and very much dominated by them are Hale, Proctor, Corey and Nurse. And then with even less power because they've been arrested and charged with witchcraft are their wives, Elizabeth, Martha and Rebecca. Tichaba is still in jail because even though she testified, even though she named names, she's of color, she's a victim of racism, she's a slave, so they haven't let her out. And then right at the bottom, Sarah Good, Goody Osborne, Bridget Bishop, they're still social outcasts. But look at how Abigail and the girls have moved up this power hierarchy and how they've twisted reputation and sacrificed any vestige of integrity and honesty so that they can have power. And of course, here um, Miller is making a comment on the USA and the McCarthy trials in the 1950s, where very much the same process of justice was at work. And in our next session, we will address these questions. Again, I think you're in a better position to answer it. Is this court actually seeking truth and justice? What does it really want to prove and why? How does it react to evidence that it doesn't want to hear? Who has power so far? Why do they have it? And if you read the play as a battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good, who's winning as this act develops? And really, is the Puritan church and court actually on the side of God and heaven and goodness? Or are they using God and heaven and goodness as the ultimate weapon in order to commit evil? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you.